So a couple of weeks ago, I made a video with Seeker about some exciting fusion news. And if you don't know what nuclear fusion is, you should go watch that video because I explained it all there. But in brief, it involves some really extreme physics that eventually results in two atoms being smashed together and it produces a huge amount of energy in addition to some other stuff. And if you do this the right way and in a controlled manner, you can harness that energy and use it to power whatever you want. And bonus, if you really do it right, then you can get way more energy out of the fusion reaction than you put into making that reaction in the first place. So you can get what is essentially limitless clean energy because the amount that you get out is so much bigger than what you put in. The thing is we haven't exactly figured out how to do all of this yet, but everybody all over the world is super invested in trying really hard to get more energy out than we put into a fusion reaction. And we're trying to do it in a couple of different ways. The two main ones involving crazy energetic lasers and big magnets. Again, super simplified, but that's the gist. The main news of that recent Seeker video was that the UK just announced that they'll be devoting 200 million pounds to a new prototype fusion power facility they're calling STEP to actually be able to achieve this fusion scenario where we get lots more energy out than we put in and to be able to use that energy to create commercial power that we could actually like use on the grid, which would seriously be amazing. Like whenever we figure this out, it's really gonna change the world. And within the confines of that five-ish minute Seeker video, I covered the basics of how Fusion works, delivered this news, and gave a brief comment on how it's interesting that this announcement comes out just as Brexit is going down. And I also mentioned that if the UK does leave the EU, it's also going to have to leave its international fusion experimental collaborations, like the main one, ITER. And yes, that is really how it's pronounced. I didn't think it was right either, but I did check with some physicist friends. It's, it's ITER. And that was pretty much it for that video. Like, all zipped up. And the video came out, I was just chilling, and then I get a Twitter notification. And I click on it to see that Andrew Steele had tweeted about the video and said, really disappointed to see Seeker and Marin Beatrice uncritically reporting propaganda from the UK government in this video. I'm all for bigging up fusion, but please ask some experts before doing politicians PR for them. And I was like, because Andrew is a scientist and science writer whose opinion I admire. So naturally, in response to this tweet, I called him. And this is what we talked about. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? If you don't know who Andrew is... I'm Dr. Andrew Steele. I'm a scientist, a writer. Um, I did a PhD in physics then decided to become a biologist and currently I'm writing a book on the biology of ageing. I've also done a bit of campaigning about science funding, so make that what you will. And my biggest question for you is, when I was researching all of this, I looked at you know world nuclear energy news, looked at Reuters, Nature did a press release on it, and that's primarily what I worked with for the video that I wrote, is that you called it government propaganda. And I'm really interested in where that perspective comes from for you. Something else to know about Andrew is that he does this really cool thing where he takes any big investment that some institution or government has devoted to achieving a certain scientific goal, say a viable fusion energy or finding a cure to cancer, and he takes that large number and divides it per taxpayer of the nation that's investing in it to get a real handle on a big number like that and what it actually means in terms of investment per person per year. I think the problem is, and again this is going to be me dividing things into pounds per person per year because that's what I do, but if you take 200 million pounds and divide it by the population of the UK which is about 60 or 70 million, then you get about three pounds each. So it's just this pathetically small amount of money. And as you rightly say, you know, if you compare 200 million to the 50 billion we think it might cost to develop fusion, again it's just this tiny, tiny amount. But the problem is that when you're a politician launching, as Boris Johnson was, and as we, you know, as we now know an election campaign, although obviously it was just a Conservative Party conference at the time. Um, you know, they throw around these numbers like, oh, we're going to invest 100 million in the northern powerhouse and have all these uh, scientific facilities in the north of England and that sort of thing. But these, you know, I don't think the general public, I don't think journalists have an understanding of what 100 million is. It sounds like a big number because it's got Ilian on the end, basically. And even you know, whether he'd announced 20 million or 200 million or 2 billion, I think everybody sort of hears that number the same. And until I drilled myself into always dividing it by the population of the UK and using that as my yardstick to try and understand how much the numbers meant, really, um, 
I think it's really difficult to get a handle on these things. Let's just be clear. The amount of funding announced for the STEP facility is 200 million pounds, which sounds like a big number, but in the grand scheme of the tens of billions that we think it will probably take to make fusion energy a reality, 200 million is a tiny drop in the bucket. It comes out to about three pounds per person per year for the UK population. But on the other hand, that 200 million is only for the first three years of the project, which is simply the design of the plant. And the announcement did also include that if the design is approved and actually building the facility is given the go ahead, then more funding will be needed. So they do acknowledge that the 200 million isn't what's gonna get us all the way to fusion, right? And all of this is stuff that I did cover in the secret video. But the truly key part of the announcement and the thing left out of the way most people covered this news, including me, is... The, the other aspect of this is, as you mentioned, Brexit. And um, this is at a time when the UK, when we notified that we were gonna leave the EU, in that same letter, uh, Theresa May, who was then the Prime Minister, notified that she was gonna leave something called Euratom which is the European sort of union of atomic energy stuff. And they do a load of different things. They deal with um, nuclear power, they deal with nuclear waste. They also deal with bringing in the radioactive isotopes that are used in cancer treatment and in some kind of uh, medical scans. So pulling out of this agreement is a huge deal for the UK. And we really haven't, even now, even you know, years down the line, explained exactly how we're going to replace that functionality. And one of the things that this means we'll lose is the funding for the jet site in Cullum where STEP would be built. And so throwing the sort of few years running costs back at them, having taken away potentially their entire source of funding, that's why I think it's government propaganda, because they're throwing out this thing where you know, it's, it's an obvious uh, piece of good news that giving science more money, you know, nobody can argue that's a bad thing in itself. But so, the way it's announced and the background, the context within which it was announced, means that it isn't as amazing as it sounds at first glance. So let's just get this straight. Brexit means a lot of things, like so many things that it's really difficult to absorb them all and understand what they may mean for you as an individual, much less what it might mean for your country as a whole. But the things that keep blowing my mind are the effects that Brexit could have on science and research. And perhaps most key and most immediate to most people's lives, medicine. As Andrew mentioned, a hardline Brexit also means an exit from Eurotom. And Eurotom is what provides Britain with its medical isotopes. Medical isotopes are radioactive compounds like barium and iodine and lots of others that have a very short half-life. That means they don't last very long in your body before they decay into other stuff that just gets flushed out, which is good. We don't want them to hang out too long in our bodies. But they do have the very important job of fluorescing so that when you ingest them or you inject them into your veins, you can see different things about what's going on inside your body. They help us see what's going on inside our bodies on medical imaging scans. Medical isotopes can also be really important for things like the radiation treatments used to treat some kind of cancers. And because these elements have short half-lives, I mean, that's part of the reason we use them in medicine, you can't just stockpile them. They'll lose their usefulness if you hang on to them for too long. So if plans aren't put in place, like plans for what the UK is going to do without Eurotom's supply of medical isotopes, then not to be a total alarmist here, but if, and it's looking a hell of a lot more like when the UK leaves the EU, patients in the UK may not be able to get something like a PET scan or potentially life-saving radiation treatment for their cancer in their home country. And nobody's talked at all about any kind of plan to mitigate this possibility. And no one I saw in all of my research about this new planned proposal and funding for STEP, which is important in the nuclear science community in the UK, was talking about this broader general context of nuclear science funding in the UK and what Brexit means for it and why this facility funding news is coming out now when we're facing those changes. And in Andrew's view, not talking about all of that was just amplifying this bait and switch move on behalf of the British government. Hey, we're about to allocate 200 million pounds in three years to fusion research, which is something we're already doing with international collaboration. F that, because we're about to leave the EU and therefore those projects. Right. But you do know that leaving the European Union means leaving all of our international fusion collaborations and therefore all that money? Yeah, but 200 million pounds! I am starting to see Andrew's initial point here. So now, 
we come to how this happened. Like, how did reporting of this headline get so far removed from the broader general context of nuclear science research in the UK? With, with a political issue, the facts are can be obfuscated and are very difficult to untangle, as you say. Like, people will argue still about anything to do with Eurotom and, and Britain uh, leaving it and what it might mean for, for research in the UK. You know, how, how does one at attack an issue like that? in a way that serves the public well and is still relatively unbiased and apolitical. That's it. I know that's, I don't think we're gonna solve the problem right here, right now, you and me, but <laughs> I think it's an interesting question to try and discuss. Yeah, and I think in general, actually, science communication does shy away from engaging in political discussions. And I, I'm, you know, I'm not the only person doing this, but I feel like I've really tried to make science policy communication a thing, because it sounds so dry. Yeah. Like I've literally done stand-up <laughs> routines about science funding. And when you tell yeah. people I did this six minute stand-up routine at the Hammersmith Apollo in London about science funding, they're like, and I'm like honestly, it was funny, you know, people did laugh. Funny, <laughs> like, well, since we're talking about health, let's look at how much we in the UK spend per person per year on alcohol. <laughs> 600 pounds. It's, it's crazy how you can, you can make these things engaging, but it's just a very difficult thing to do. And it's particularly hard. You're, you're mm. say, you say you're constrained by the format, you've got six minutes. Um, we're going to end up talking for a lot more than six minutes about this stuff. The problem fundamentally with all of this stuff to go all the economics is just incentives. Mm. And, you know, as a YouTuber, there's not a huge amount of incentive, and I'm not accusing you of this at all, there's not a huge amount of incentive to get stuff right. Because mm. your, your, your ratings, your metrics, your number of likes, doesn't particularly depend on getting every last detail correct. You'll get some nerd like me who'll you know, pop up and complain about it on Twitter. But ultimately, I'm only one like or dislike on the video. It's not gonna make a huge amount of difference. And the same is true is, uh, with politicians and with the public. You know, members of the public don't have the incentive to really inform themselves about science and particularly the politics of science in where they cut and then you know that goes on to influence where they cast their votes and that then means that politicians don't have any incentive to particularly engage with science and so you know in the UK looking at our parliament there's always a handful of MPs who are very interested in science and try and push it in their work but you know outside those people who've obviously got that interest probably a pre-existing interest before they go into parliament Mm -hmm. Most MPs just aren't particularly bothered and see it as a bit of an inconvenience and a bit of a confusing, difficult subject to not have to deal with. You know, it may take 20 minutes to learn about what right now in my busy day. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so, because of that lack of incentive, it doesn't happen. And so, fundamentally, you know, that's a that's a really difficult question because that's where you're going to have to go and you know, redesign society and redesign the way that we do our politics, which is probably beyond easy, the scope of this show. <laughs> oh man. I don't know, what do you guys think? I mean, this stuff is really complicated, but I think it's really worth talking about. Should science news outlets like Seeker get political? Is simply covering all of the context and background getting political? Or does it just give us all of the information we need to come to informed decisions on our own? Like if I had included all of this info in the original Seeker video, would you have thought our coverage was biased? I do kind of wish I had done a deeper dive or at least been able to find someone else, anyone else talking about this and how it relates to this announcement in order to indicate at least a little more in that video that there's lots more going on. But I'd love to know what you think. I mean, when you think about it, all of science is affected by the wider political sphere of what's going on in their countries with funding and attitudes towards results. It's this big tangled ball. It's not just the science. So maybe we can't always just talk about the science. We lose meaning about what the science is doing and what the science is if we don't talk about the rest of it too. If nothing else, I hope me and Andrew's conversation gave you some more context for this news and some more to think about. And I'm a firm believer in the fact that constructive criticism and open conversation just takes us all to the next level. It makes us all more critical of what we're consuming in the media and what information may be getting left out and what that means. And hopefully it makes everybody's science communication better and more useful and means that we all, us as communicators, audiences, everybody can learn and grow just a little more and with more nuance. Okay, the world can seem like a garbage fire, but the least we can do is all be good humans who think and communicate and collaborate, and I think only good things can come of that. I guess that's my point. I guess that's it. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.